James Watt by Andrew Carnegie Chapter 8 The Record of the Steam Engine The Soho Works, up to January 1824, had completed 1,164 steam engines, of a nominal horsepower of 25,945. From January 1824 to 1854, 441 engines, nominal horsepower, 25,278, making the total number 1,605, of nominal horsepower, 51,223, and real horsepower, 167,319. Mulhall gives the total steam power of the world as 50,150,000 horsepower in 1888. In 1880 it was only 34,150,000. Thus in eight years it increased, say, fifty per cent. Assuming the same rate of increase from 1888 to 1905, a similar period, it is today seventy-five million nominal, which Engel says may be taken as one-half the effective power, vide Mulhall, steam, page 546, the real horsepower in 1905 being one hundred fifty million. One horsepower raises ten tons a height of twelve inches per minute. Working eight hours, this is about five thousand tons daily, or twelve times a man's work. And as the engine never tires, it can be run constantly. It follows that each horsepower it can exert equals thirty-six men's work. But, allowing for stoppages, let us say thirty men. The engines of a large ocean greyhound of thirty-five thousand horsepower, running constantly from port to port, equal to three relays of twelve men per horsepower, is daily exerting the power of one million two hundred sixty thousand men, or one hundred five thousand horses. Assuming that all the steam engines in the world upon the average work double the hours of men, then the one hundred fifty million horsepower in the world, each equal to two relays of twelve men per horsepower, exerts the power of three billion six hundred million of men. There are only one-tenth as many male adults in the world, estimating one in five of the population. If we assume that all steam engines work an average of only eight hours in the twenty-four, as men and horses do, those on duty longer hours are not under continuous exertion, it still follows that the one hundred fifty million of effective steam power, each doing the work of twelve men, equals the work of one billion eight hundred million of men or of 150 million of horses. Engel estimated that in 1880 the value of world industries dependent upon steam was 32,000 millions of dollars, and that in 1888 it had reached 43,000 millions of dollars. It is today doubtless more than 60,000 millions of dollars. A great increase, no doubt, over 1880, but the one figure is as astounding as the other, for both mean nothing that can be grasped. The chief steam-using countries are America, 14,400,000 horsepower in 1888, Britain, 9,200,000 horsepower nominal. If we add the British colonies and dependencies, 7,120,000 horsepower, the English-speaking race had three-fifths of all the steam-power of the world. In 1840 Britain had only 620,000 horsepower nominal. The United States seven hundred sixty thousand. The whole world had only one million six hundred fifty thousand horsepower. Today it has seventy five million nominal. So rapidly has steam extended its sway over most of the earth in less than the span of a man's life. There has never been any development in the world's history comparable to this, nor can we imagine that such a rapid transformation can ever come in the future. What the future is finally to bring forth even imagination is unable to conceive. No bounds can be set to its forthcoming possible, even probable, wonders. But as such a revolution as steam has brought must come from a superior force capable of displacing steam, this would necessarily be a much longer task than steam had in occupying an entirely new field without a rival. The contrast between Newcomen and Watt is interesting. The Newcomen engine consumed twenty-eight pounds of coal per horsepower and made not exceeding three to four strokes per minute, the piston moving about fifty feet per minute. Today, 
steam marine engines on one and one-third pounds of coal per horsepower the monster ships using less make from seventy to ninety revolutions per minute destroyers reach four hundred per minute small steam engines it is stated have attained six hundred revolutions per minute the piston to-day is supposed to travel moderately when at one thousand feet per minute in a cylinder three feet long this gives one hundred sixty six revolutions per minute with coal under the boilers costing one dollar per net ton from say five pounds of coal for one cent there is one horsepower for three hours or a day and a night of continuous running for eight cents countless millions of men and of horses would be useless for the work of the steam engine for the seemingly miraculous quality steam possesses that permits concentration is as requisite as its expansive powers one hundred thousand horsepower or several hundred thousand horsepower is placed under one roof and directed to the task required sixty four thousand horsepower is concentrated in the hold of the great steamships now building all this stupendous force is evolved concentrated and regulated by science from the most unpromising of substances cold water nothing man has discovered or imagined is to be named with the steam engine it has no fellow franklin capturing the lightning morse annihilating space with the telegraph bell transmitting speech through the air by the telephone are not less mysterious being more ethereal perhaps in one sense they are even more so still the labor of the world performed by heating cold water places watt and his steam engine in a class apart by itself many are the inventions for applying power his creates the power it applies whether the steam engine has reached its climax and gas oil or other agents are to be used extensively for power in the near future is a question now debated in scientific circles much progress has been made in using these substitutes and more is probable as one obstacle after another is overcome gas especially is coming forward and oil is freely used for reasons before stated it seems to the writer that where coal is plentiful the day is distant when steam will not continue to be the principal source of power it will be a world surpriser that beats one horsepower developed by one pound of coal the power to do much more than this however lies theoretically in gas but there come these wise words of arago to mind persons whose whole lives have been devoted to speculative labors are not aware how great the distance is between a scheme apparently the best concerted and its realization so true watt's ideas in the brain and the steam engine that he had to evolve during nine long years are somewhat akin to the great gulf between resolve and performance the good resolution that soothes and the act that exalts the steam engine is scotland's chief though not her only contribution to the material progress of the world watt was its inventor we might almost write creator so multiform were the successive steps symington by the steamship stretched one arm of it over the water stevenson by the locomotive stretched the other over the land thus was the world brought under its sway and conditions of human life transformed watt and symington were born in scotland within a few miles of each other stevenson's forebears moved from scotland south of the line previous to his birth as fulton's parents removed from scotland to america so that both stevenson and fulton could boast with gladstone that the blood in their veins was scotch the history of the world has no parallel to the change effected by the inventions of these three men strange that little scotland with only one million five hundred thousand people in seventeen ninety one about one half the population of new york city should have been the mother of such a triad and that her second mighty three wallace bruce and burns always first should have been of the same generation working upon the earth near each other at the same time the watt engine appeared in seventeen eighty two the steamship in eighteen o one the locomotive thirteen years later in eighteen fourteen thus thirty-two years after its appearance watt's steam engine had conquered both sea and land the sociologist may theorize but plain people will remember that men do not gather grapes from thorns nor figs from thistles there must be something in the soil which produces such men something in the poverty that compels exertion something in the land of the mountain and the flood that stirs the imagination 
something in the history of centuries of struggle for national and spiritual independence, much in the system of compulsory and universal free education, something of all these elements mingling in the blood that tells, and enables Scotland to contribute so largely to the progress of the world. Strange reticence is shown by all Watts' historians regarding his religious and political views. Williamson, the earliest author of his memoirs, is full of interesting facts obtained from people in Greenock who had known Watt well. The hesitation shown by him as to Watt's orthodoxy in his otherwise highly eulogistic tribute attracts attention. He says, We could desire to know more of the state of those affections which are more purely spiritual by their nature and origin his disposition to those supreme truths of revelation which alone really elevate and purify the soul in the absence of much information of a very positive kind in regard to such points of character and life we instinctively revert in a case like this to the principles and maxims of an infantile and early training remembering the piety portrayed in the ancestors of this great man one cannot but cling to the hope that his many virtues reposed on a substratum of more than merely moral excellence. Let us cherish the hope that the calm which rested on the spirit of the pilgrim was one that caught its radiance from a far higher sphere than that of the purest human philosophy. Watt's breaking of the Sabbath before recorded must have seemed to that stern Calvinist a heinous sin justifying grave doubts of Watt's spiritual condition, his moral excellence to the contrary notwithstanding. Williamson's estimate of moral excellence had recently been described by Burns. But then, now thanks to him for all that. Now goodly symptom, ye can call that. It's nothing but a milder feature of our poor sinful corrupt nature. Ye'll get the best of moral works, many black gentoos and pagan works, or hunters wild on ponotoxy, what never heard of orthodoxy. Williamson's doubts had much stronger foundation in Watt's non-attendance at church, for, as we shall see from his letter to De Luke, July 1788, he had never attended the meeting-house, dissenting church, in Birmingham, although he claimed to be still a member of the Presbyterian body in declining the sheriffalty. It seems probable that Watt and his theological views, like Priestley and others of the Lunar Society, was in advance of his age, and more or less in accord with Burns, who was then astonishing his countrymen. Perhaps he had forestalled Dean Stanley's advice in his rectorial address to the students of St. Andrew's University, Go to Burns for your theology. Yet he remained a deeply religious man to the end, as we see from his letter, page 216, at the age of seventy-six. We know that politically Watt was in advance of his times, for the Prime Minister pronounced him a sad radical. He was with Burns politically at all events. Watt's eldest son, then in Paris, was carried away by the French Revolution, and Muirhead suggests that the Prime Minister must have confounded father and son, but it seems unreasonable to suppose that he could have been so misled as to mistake the doings of the famous Watt in Birmingham for those of his impulsive son in France. The French Revolution exerted a powerful influence in Britain, especially in the north of England and south of Scotland, which have much in common. The Lunar Society of Birmingham was intensely interested. At one of the meetings in the summer of 1788, held at her father's house, Mrs. Shimopiniac records that Mr. Bolton presented to the company his son, just returned from a long sojourn in Paris, who gave a vivid account of proceedings there, Watt and Dr. Priestley being present. A few months later the revolution broke out. Young Harry Priestley, a son of the doctors, one evening burst into the drawing-room, waving his hat and crying, Hurrah! Liberty! Reason! Brotherly love forever! Down with kingcraft and priestcraft! The majesty of the people forever! France is free! Dr. Priestley was deeply stirred and became the most prominent of all in the cause of the rights of man. He held the acts of the National Assembly abolishing monarchy, nobility, and church. He was often engaged in discussions with the local clergy on theological dogmas. He wrote a pamphlet upon the French Revolution, and Burke attacked him in the House of Commons. All this naturally concentrated local opposition upon him as leader. The enthusiasts mistakenly determined to have a public dinner to celebrate the anniversary of the Revolution, and no less than eighty gentlemen attended, although many advised against it. Priestley himself was not present. 
A mob collected outside and demolished the windows. The cry was raised, To the new meeting-house, the chapel in which Priestley ministered. The chapel was set on fire. Thence the riot proceeded to Priestley's house. The doctor and his family, being warned, had left shortly before. The house was at the mercy of the mob, which broke in, destroyed furniture, chemical laboratory, and library, and finally set fire to the house. Some of the very best citizens suffered in like manner. Mr. Ryland, one of the most munificent benefactors of the town, Mr. Taylor, the banker, and Hutton, the estimable bookseller, were among the number. The home of Dr. Withering, member of the Lunar Society, was entered, but the timely arrival of troops saved it from destruction. The members of the Lunar Society, or the lunatics as they were popularly called, were especially marked for attack. The mob cried, No philosophers! Church and King for ever! All this put Bolton and Watt upon their guard, for they were prominent members of the Society. They called their workmen together, explained the criminality of the rioters, and placed arms in their hands on their promise to defend them if attacked. Meanwhile everything portable was packed up, ready to be removed. Watt wrote to Mr. De Luc, July 19, 1791, Though our principles, which are well known as friends to the established government and enemies of republican principles, should have been our protection from a mob whose watchword was Church and King, yet our safety was principally owing to most of the dissenters living south of the town, for after the first moment they did not seem over nice in their discrimination of religion and principles. I, among others, was pointed out as a Presbyterian, though I never was in a meeting-house, dissenting church, in Birmingham, and Mr. Bolton is well known as a churchman. We had everything most portable packed up, fearing the worst. However, all is well with us." From all this we gather the impression that radical principles had permeated the leading minds of Birmingham to a considerable extent, probably around the Lunar Society district in greater measure than in other quarters, although clubs of ardent supporters were formed in London and the principal provincial cities. In the political field we have only one appearance of Watt reported. Early in 1784 we find him taking the lead in getting up a loyal address to the King on the appointment as Prime Minister of Pitt, who proposed to tax coal, iron, copper, and other raw materials of manufacture to the amount of five million dollars per year, a considerable sum in those days, when manufacturing was in its infancy. Bolton also joined in opposition. They wisely held that for a manufacturing nation to tax raw materials was suicidal. Let taxes be laid upon luxuries, upon vices, and, if you like, upon property. Tax riches when got, but not the means of getting them. Of all things don't cut open the hen that lays the golden eggs. Watt's services were enlisted, and he drew up a paper for circulation upon the subject. The policy failed, and soon after Pitt was converted to sounder doctrines by Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. Free trade has ruled Britain ever since and being the country that could manufacture cheapest, and indeed the only manufacturing country for many years, this policy has made her the richest per capita of all nations. The day may not be far distant when America, soon to be the cheapest manufacturing country for many, as it already is for a few staple articles, will be crying for free trade, and urging free entrance to the markets of the world, to tax the luxuries and vices, to tax wealth got and not in the making, as proposed by Watt and Bolton is the policy to follow. Watt shows himself to have been a profound economist. Watt had cause for deep anxiety for his eldest son, James, who had taken an active part in the agitation. He and his friend Mr. Cooper of Manchester were appointed deputies by the Constitutional Society to proceed to Paris and present an address of congratulation to the Jacobin Club. Young Watt was carried away, and became intimate with the leaders. Southey says he actually prevented a duel between Danton and Robespierre by appearing on the ground and remonstrating with them, pointing out that if either fell the cause must suffer. Upon young Watt's return, King's messengers arrived in Birmingham and seized persons concerned in seditious correspondence. Watt suggests that Bolton should see his son and arrange for his leaving for America, or some foreign land, for a time. This proved to be unnecessary. His son was not arrested, and in a short time all was forgotten. He entered the works with Bolton's son as partner, and became an admirable manager. Today we regard his mild republicanism, his alliance with Jacobin leaders, 
and especially his bold intervention in the quarrel between two of the principal actors in the tragedy of the French Revolution, as a ribbon in the cap of youth. That his deuce father did the same and was proud of his eldest-born seems probable. Our readers will also judge for themselves whether the proud father had not himself a strong liking for democratic principles, the rights of the people, the royalty of man, which Burns was then blazing forth, and held such sentiments as quite justified the Prime Minister's accusation that he was a sad radical. In Britain, since Watt's day, all traces of opposition to monarchy aroused by the French Revolution have disappeared as completely as the monarchy of King George. The limited monarchy of to-day, developed during the admirable reign of Queen Victoria, has taken its place. The French abolished monarchy by a frontal attack upon the citadel, involving serious loss. Not such the policy of the colder Britain. He won his great victory, losing nothing, by flanking the position. That the king could do no wrong is a doctrine almost coeval with modern history, flowing from the divine right of kings, and as such was quietly accepted. It needed only to be properly harnessed to become a very serviceable agent for registering the people's will. It was obvious that the acceptance of the doctrine that the king could do no wrong involved the duty of proving the truth of the axiom, and it was equally obvious that the only possible way of doing this was that the king should not be allowed to do anything. Hence he was made the mouthpiece of his ministers, and it is not the king but they who, being fallible men, may occasionally err. The monarch, in losing power to do anything, has gained power to influence everything. The ministers hold office through the approval of the House of Commons. Members of that House are elected by the people. Thus stands government in Britain, broad-based upon the people's will. All that the revolutionists of Watt's day desired has, in substance, been obtained, and Britain has become in truth a crowned republic, with government of the people, for the people, and by the people. This steady and beneficent development was peaceably attained. The difference between the French and British methods is that between revolution and evolution. In America's political domain, a similar evolution has been even more silently at work than in Britain during the past century, and is not yet exhausted. The transformation of a loose confederacy of sovereign states with different laws into one solid government, which assumes control and ensures uniformity over one department after another. The centripetal forces grow stronger with the years. Power leaves the individual states and drifts to Washington, as the necessity for each successive change becomes apparent. In the regulation of interstate commerce, of trusts, and in other fields, final authority over the whole land gravitates more and more to Washington. It is a beneficent movement, likely to result in uniform national laws upon many subjects in which present diversity creates confusion. Marriage and divorce laws, bankruptcy laws, corporation charter privileges, and many other important questions may be expected to become uniform under this evolutionary process. The Supreme Court decision that the Union was an indissoluble union of indissoluble states carries with it finally uniform regulation of many interstate problems, in every respect salutary, and indispensable for the perfect union of the American people. End of chapter 8